Thanks, yeah, I'm, I'm Nick Fraser. I'm from uh, uh, Xilinx Research Labs in uh, Dublin in Ireland, and I'm a research engineer, and I'm just, I'm just here to talk to you about uh, what we're doing in, uh, uh, what we're doing in sort of uh, neural network inference on the edge. Um, I'm gonna start with a little, little bit of an apology. Uh, I'm a little bit under the weather today, so um, uh, if, if my voice cuts out at any point, I hope to just stand here and uh, flick through the slides and uh, hope you guys get the gist. <laughs> and I'm also still just processing uh, John Lucas' talk. Uh, there's a few quotes that are gonna stick with me for a while. I think uh, physics is even better than politics at limiting what can be done. Uh, <laughs> I think that might stick with me for a few years, actually. Um, okay, so uh, we, we, we've seen this theme in a, in a few talks now, actually, is that you know, machine learning is permeating sort of so many spaces, so many application domains. It's pretty difficult to, to say, you know, anything really concrete about, you know, what a neural network can be. I mean, people that train them and people that, that study them know that a neural network is basically any arbitrary compute graph that is semi-differentiable. I mean, if you've got one of those, you can train some weights and you can do, you know, sort of whatever you want. And so we need, we need architectures that are flexible, but also particularly, I think, on the edge, we have a really, really diverse set of constraints. I mean, uh, we heard a lot of, lot of talk about this in the, in the previous session, you know. So the constraints for training a neural network to do sort of uh, language translation is completely different from one that you might stick in a car to do object detection uh, to make sure that you, you know, can tell the difference between a person and a car and therefore make the right decision to either stay going as you're going or maybe make some evasive action, right? And so, sort of specifically, this is a really big challenge, right? You know, all of these applications have different requirements for things like throughput, latency, energy, and accuracy. And in particular, when we're getting into sort of resource-constrained environments, actually, you know, as was discussed in the previous session, um, we're going to have to make different trade-offs uh, between these to actually get a system that we can actually deploy. So just to follow up on this a little bit, right, so this is a whole bunch of networks that we've just taken, and we've just mapped out, you know, how many, how many giga ops per frame is needed to do a single inference, and what's the sort of memory overhead in terms of weight. So we have a big spectrum of networks. On the left, you probably have like your very old sort of traditional multi-layer multi perceptrons to your sort of image net classification networks, moving through things like object detection, semantic segmentation, and then onto stuff like LSTMs, where you have slightly different compute patterns and you have some dependencies, um, and things like speech recognition, where I think uh, we're, seeing, um, we're seeing the largest peak in your sort of giga ops per frame, at least, at least that I've seen, right? Um, now, this, this just sort of adds to my first point, right? We've got such a broad range of applications. They have some different compute patterns. We're gonna need architectures that are actually, that are actually adaptable to these problems, and we're probably gonna to need to do some, some other things to actually, uh, to actually sort of reduce this huge computational requirement. So we're gonna step into the first, the first topic of my discussion, which is about low precision arithmetic. Um, so quantization was mentioned in one of the previous sessions about a way of uh, reducing memory overheads, but I want you to also think of it as, in particular with things like FPGAs, as a way to actually reduce your power consumption and to increase your throughput. Okay, so, so for example, right, uh, when we're talking about quantization of neural networks, we're talking about, okay, maybe you've trained your neural network and using a standard framework, uh, one would expect it has something like single precision floating point for all the weights and activations within it, right? Um, but if, you're, if you use some clever tricks, actually, uh, in many cases, maybe you can get this down to maybe as low as binary weights and binary activations. And for something like an FPGA, where we're, um, again, to counter a previous talk, we're actually are ah, instantiating our multiply and accumulates, um, 
this, this can lead to something like over 100x in performance uh, density on, a single, on, a, on the same device with respect to something like floating point. Um, also, an extra benefit is we reduce our memory footprint. And uh, this might mean that for a lot of interesting models, we can actually store all of our weight memory on chip. This is going to save us from going to DDR and is going gonna, is gonna to allow us to avoid memory bottlenecks and such things. Furthermore, right, as I said before, we increase performance, but we also, we also save power. So this is a, this is a figure on, on the right adapted from a, a Bill Daly paper I, that I already saw today, so I won't talk too much about it, just showing the difference energy cost in different operations, be it floating point or fixed point at different bit widths. Um, and down the bottom, what's really interesting is the energy cost of doing reads from DRAM and SRAM and such things. And so lowering, lowering precision means we have to do less reads from memory, maybe, maybe no reads from external memory, and our actual, our actual uh, power of each operation um, is significantly reduced. And so just, just to quickly, the chart on the left where on the x-axis we have power consumption. This is actually just a model. This isn't measured power consumption. And we have test error. And here we've just taken a, a, an LSTM for optical character recognition and basically we've trained it for different precisions of weights and activations, right? And so we've drawn in here the Pareto frontier. So any of those points uh, along the line might be of interest. But I just want to highlight these ones down the bottom. So if you, if you use something like 8-bit weights and 8-bit activations and you go to 3-bit weights, um, you're going to save about 30% of your energy. Um, and you're going to do it from a pretty negligible drop in accuracy. I think negligible, I think you need to, it's all for, um, it's all for other people to decide. This may or may not fit your requirements. Um, but this should be an option moving forward. Now, this reduced precision does come as, at a cost, as, as we alluded to before, and that cost is maybe a drop in accuracy. Um, so this, this chart is just me trying to map out um, all of the publications that I can on uh, ImageNet test error for reduced precision uh, neural networks from papers and comparing it against uh, ImageNet winners of, over the years, right? Um, so there's a few things to note. So the bottom line, the bottom line are image net winners. So although you might look at this and you see, ah, okay, well, there's at least something like a 4% accuracy gap here. I just want to put these numbers in a little bit more context, right? So the bottom line is image net winners, right? So past ones that I can think of off the top of my head are Google and Microsoft and IBM. And they have a lot of time to do things like hyperparameter optimization, right? Compared with most of these papers are actually single universities doing this sort of research. The second thing is all of the numbers for the ImageNet winners are all ensembling techniques and are doing multi-cropping. And this is something that you don't really see when people are just presenting a paper on a new quantization scheme. So in particular, with, uh, with GoogleNet, who won in, um, I believe it was 2014, right? Um, what, what they do when you read the details of the paper, to get their last, I believe, 4% of accuracy, right? They use an ensemble of eight GoogleNets, all trained with different weight initializations. And they do something like 144 crops of the test set image and do something like a voting system or an average to work out what their actual prediction will be, right? If you do the math, eight times 144, you end up with over a thousand increase in inference costs just to get that bit of accuracy difference. So if you use these same techniques here, I would expect you would see even less difference. Um, so the next thing is, um, as we said, we're, we're looking at things on the edge and often we have certain constraints. And what we're really interested in is we're really interested in finding what we call Pareto optimal solutions. So what's the best, what's the best trade-off 
for the sort of resources that you have on an FPGA, right? So here in this plot, on the x-axis, we have a sort of weighted sum of uh, compute resources that we have on an FPGA. Um, and on the, on the y-axis, we have ImageNet, ImageNet uh, validation set error. And here we've just plotted, based on a simple model, a bunch of different networks, some that we've trained in-house, some that are available in other papers. And we've tried to understand, you know, given a certain level of resources, what's the best network that we could, that we could deploy? So you could, so you could look at this in a few ways. You could take a vertical slice and you could say, hey, um, I'm only going to allow this amount of resources for my neural network because my FPGA needs to do some other things at the same time. And so whichever one is on the left side of that vertical slice and gives you the best accuracy is going to be your network of choice. Or you could take a horizontal slice and say, hey, I need this amount of accuracy. Give me, give me, the, give me the network that's going to do that in the most efficient way. Now, I just wanted to point out two particular points here, right? So here you have a ResNet 18, 8-bit 8 weights, 8-bit 8 activations. Um, it gets just over 10% validation set error on ImageNet. Um, now, if you compare it to actually a ResNet 50, which is a larger topology, it has about twice as many operations, it's a little bit more complex, um, but you use ternary weights for, uh, you use ternary weights. This gets rid of all of your multipliers, right? And this gets just under 10% uh, 10 error, right? Um, but it uses roughly half the compute resources, right? So for the same throughput, we could implement this larger ResNet 50 using simpler operations and actually get something like twice the performance out of it. Or whatever other trade-off that you have in mind. This could mean, uh, this could mean smaller area, this could mean you know, whatever else. Um, okay. Lastly, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what my team has, has worked on. And this is a, is a tool that we're calling Fin. Um, some of it is open sourced. And this is a, what we're building to sort of assist people in actually deploying neural networks on FPGAs. OK. So what it is, it's a, it's a design flow for exploring quantized neural networks, right? So basically, we do something like take a cafe prototext as an input. Um, we do some sort of pattern man matching and streamlining, merging of layers and things like that. And we actually, then we have a uh, Vivado HLS library that we, that we connect it with and basically generate specific hardware for the neural network that you have in mind. Um, we have a few releases related to this. Um, you know, uh, it's a large project and we're still working on it and not all of it is yet open source, so, you know, Go and, have a look, go and have a look at it, see if it's something that might interest you. If, uh, if, you, if you like it and you want to see more, come and contact us. Um, we're looking to uh, try to open source everything and make it all available to you. So that, there's some caveats there, but please check it out. I think it's pretty interesting. Now, um, what Finn does, Finn generates a data flow architecture, and I think this is something that's a little bit unique for FPGA. So I said, we make a custom accelerator for your specific network. And I just want to talk about what that looks like. Um, so let's, let's imagine we have a neural network like this. It's got uh, something like uh, 10 convolutional layers and some max pools. And it's, it's pretty simple, right? This is a sort of linear topology. Um, now, what we do in a data flow architecture, right? We actually instantiate a compute engine for each individual layer, right? And this gives us this gives us gives us a couple of little advantages, right? So, one thing we don't have to buffer entire images between each layer, right? This allows us to save um, to save uh, to save memory there. Um, we're using reduced precision, so probably all of these weight buffers we can store on chip. I mean, of course, it all depends on what your network is. Um, and if we use it in the right way, we can get low latency and a high throughput. Okay, so we instantiate, we instantiate these different layers, but we can also take advantage of, so here we have two different layers that have two different quantization requirements. Now, this is something that would be pretty annoying to do in an ASIC, is to, to build 
to build a computer array that's able to support, say, uh, 8-bit weights and 8-bit activations, and also support 1-bit weights and 3-bit activations. Um, there's some things that you can do, but it's, but it's a little bit annoying, right? But here on FPGAs, we're instantiating a specific compute engine for each of these layers. We can use the resources that make sense for that particular, for that particular layer. So for example, 8-bit weights and 8-bit activations, we can map those pretty well to the DSP slices that we have available in our FPGAs. Uh, for 1-bit weight, 3-bit activations, um, those map a lot better to LUTs, right? So we just have our first layer, uh, layer zero, right, implemented in DSPs, our second layer implemented in LUTs. And so we can balance resources a little bit that way and also uh, tailor the specific requirements of the layer and build the corresponding compute engine. The very last thing, right, we adjust the parallelism of each of these compute engines um, to match, <laughs> to match the difference in the number of operations in each layer. So for example, um, so in terms of the number of mega ops between these two layers, uh, we have about a factor of 20x difference, right? So uh, what we do is we say, okay, well, layer one needs to have 20x the throughput of layer zero. And so we, un we unfold and we um, adjust the amount of parallelism so that, so that that is true. And what this means is that we can get a balanced data flow, right? So every single compute engine um, actually processes an input at the same rate or a very similar rate. This means that we can get very high utilization out of these compute engines, right? And known latency and things like that. And it kind of helps us in, uh, avoid these sort of one size fits all solution problems that you have. You know, uh, if you make a very large matrix multiply and then you have weird size matrices and you try to map them on there, you get some inefficiencies that come in inherently. We just go like, no, let's, let's just build a compute engine. Let's instantiate a compute engine for each layer that's tailored for that layer, right? And we're gonna have some throughput requirements and we'll just adjust the parallelism to match that. So what happens when you implement all of this, right? Um, so you get pretty good performance on pretty low power devices. Um, you get really high, really high energy efficiency. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, what else to say. That's, um, so in this particular case, uh, the top two networks are implemented in a data flow structure like the one that I described uh, earlier. Um, the bottom two are implemented with a multi-layer offload. And so you can think of this as a sort of smaller data flow, right? You take some subwet, subset of the structure of that network. You implement that as a data flow and you schedule the network across that. So this is how you handle things like what happens when uh, your network's too big and maybe you can't fit all of the memory on board, right? Okay. <laughs> so to summarize, uh, the requirements of neural networks are pretty diverse. Um, one size fits all solutions are maybe not always the answer. Um, low precision arithmetic means that we can get better throughput and reduce the memory footprint of, uh, of, um, um, uh, of our neural network inference engines. Um, customized data flow architectures mean that we can get extremely high utilization out of the, uh, the resources that we're putting to us as, as, as we can. And uh, finally, uh, check out our open source projects. Um, maybe there's something there that you might find useful or um, and feel free to bother us and all that sort of stuff. Thanks so much. Um, thank you.